Kali Spera sa... Kali Spera... Kali Spera sa... Kiris ke Kiri. Something still sounds wrong. But let's try this. Ime i Bono Westcote, the Athintria Tis Americani Kis Colis Classicons Budon Sinathina. Anke poli discoles i stigmes ya olas mas, sas calisorizo edo apopse. Stin triti mas dialexi classicis archeologias ke historias tis technis. Thamas milisi odio crecumrenos milititis ke catigitis sanjaya facur, apoto Colorado College. Fetos o catigitis thacur ine enas apotus whitehead distinguished scholars Tiscolis. Idealic situ afora ton athletismo stin odisia tu omiru. Exatazundas tin archea politismiki gnosi ya ton athletismo ke ti simasia tu sto epos avto. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Bonna Westcote, director of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. Although this is a very difficult time for us, I would still like to welcome you here this evening to our third lecture on classical archaeology and art history. Our speaker this evening is Professor Sanjay Thacker, Judson Bemis Professor of Humanities and Professor of Classics at Colorado College, and this year, Elizabeth A. Whitehead Distinguished Scholar at the school. Professor Thacker is author of numerous articles on Augustan literature and culture, but his research interests also include ancient sport, both Greek and Roman. In this presentation this evening, Professor Thacker will talk about athletics in Homer's Odyssey, examining ancient cultural knowledge of sport and its importance in the poem. Please join me in welcoming Professor Thacker. Thank you. Thank you, Bana. Kiris Kikiri, Kalisperesas. To those of you here in Athens, uh, good evening. To those of you who are online, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for attending and tuning in. Before I begin my paper proper, let me begin with several thank yous. Perhaps this is a reversal of custom of how one normally organizes a Kotzen talk. But I feel exceptionally lucky to have this opportunity to be in Athens and have a forum in which I can publicly acknowledge many of those of you who have supported uh, me in getting here. It is the greatest honor to serve as a Whitehead professor and scholar this year. First, my deepest thanks to those who supported my application and selected me for this position. My thanks to Director Bonna Westcote, who has been an amazing leader at the school, especially for letting me join her on the first fall school trip. Thanks to Tom and Natalia for sharing their knowledge and love of Crete during the magnificent school tour in October. To Kathy Kiesling, my fellow Whitehead, who's been a kindred spirit, a model of collegiality, and a font of knowledge, as well as simply being a wonderful person. And to Brendan Burke, who's been a fantastic Mellon professor, sharing his love and knowledge of Greece, and Boeotia in particular, being a great organizer and leader of the academic program, and preparing so thoroughly for sites and trips in a way that belies all the hard work he has undertaken. I hate to lump all the staff members at the school into a collective, but I fear if I start naming names, A, I'll never actually get to my talk, and B, I'll leave someone out. So a broad thank you to the men who I consider family, and in some cases have known for nearly 20 years. Without a doubt, my first year at the school as a Fulbright Scholar and Associate Member, now many years ago, was the best year of my life, a phrase you hear frequently from those who have been members at the American School. The word transformative does not do it justice, and the lifelong friends I have made are just one testament to its impact. So my greatest thanks go to those members this year who have let me tag along on all the fall trips and be part of what I hope has been a magical year for them. I am deeply appreciative of your patience, kindness, and brilliance, and most of all for letting me be part of your community. Particular thanks go to Abigail, Colin, Jackson, and Victoria for being part of my seminar. It's my great pleasure to speak to you today on Athletics in the Odyssey. Oh, I think we're... Thank 
Okay, excellent. Um, it's my deep pleasure uh, to speak to you today on athletics in Homer's Odyssey. As these lines from the beginning of the Odyssey demonstrate, Odysseus's journey home is framed in competitive terms. He's a man of athletic contests in the truest sense. His ultimate prizes are to win back his household, his wife, and even reclaim his own self. But let me begin with a praetoritio of sorts. Though this talk is about Homer, I'm not going to venture opinions or really ever even consider many of the Homeric questions that clearly have some relevance to this topic, but are far too vexing and complicated to answer in this context, such as the compositional history of the text, textual disputes and the validity of certain lines, and issues arising from the dissonance between the poem's period of composition and the period in which the poem takes place. When I refer to Homer in the singular as the author of the text, Please understand that behind that lies a much more nuanced and complicated authorial history. I want to begin with the simple thesis that athletics play a central role in the Odyssey. You'll perhaps come to see that I can be accused of reading athletics into too many moments in the story, but though there are many themes that run throughout the epic, I hope to demonstrate that athletic scenes are numerous, occur at critical moments in the text, and are used by Homer to illustrate status, identity, and power dynamics between various characters. Some of these themes are long, others are brief. But the athletics are central to how Homer defines Odysseus himself and how others view the hero. This fact has long been acknowledged. But I also argue that the scenes rely on and are reflective of a shared cultural knowledge of athletics, one notable aspect which tied together what might be considered disparate groups of what we term Hellenes or ancient Greeks. Discussions of athletics in the Odyssey are surprisingly piecemeal. And one reason I selected this topic for my research focus this academic year stems from my frustration with that fact. I think we're all familiar with the major athletic episodes, such as Book 8, where the Phaeacians put on games and when challenged, Odysseus demonstrates, amongst other things, his status as a heroic figure by grabbing a discus and out the Phaeacian competitors, a scene I'll talk about briefly later. Upon his return to Ithaca in Book 18, Odysseus gets into a boxing match with the beggar Eris. Both of these appear in just about every text on ancient sport, as does Penelope's contest of the bow, a double context in which both she and the bow itself are athla prizes. But outside of these scenes, there's not been much written on some of the briefer scenes and episodes, nor does a comprehensive discussion of athletics across the entire Odyssey exist, a situation my work seeks to resolve. Now, due to the limited time I have this evening, my discussion will have to be selective. I hope as I jump around, it doesn't become too hard to follow, and from it, you can extrapolate my broader conclusions. And I must say, before I continue, that the images that I'm showing are sort of more for just associative purposes and not directly related to the text. I do know they date from significantly different periods, but I thought you'd want something more than just text tonight. I've divided my paper into three parts. The first is a discussion of Menelaus' speech to Telemachus in book four, focusing on his story of Odysseus wrestling and his own encounter with Proteus. I hope to demonstrate that the significance of the wrestling scene is greater than has been acknowledged, partially seen by the fact that Telemachus repeats it verbatim in his conversation with Penelope in Book 17. Second, I'll look at a brief set of lines, repeated twice in the poem, that also appear in Books 4 and 17, in which the suitors are depicted engaging in athletic practice. And I will close with a discussion of several scenes of throwing, which I argue we should associate with discus or weight throwing, which further helped to define Odysseus through his athletic prowess against others and their lack of success. Though I'll treat these rather cursorily, I am including them as just one example to show how athletic scenes and imagery occur frequently and repeatedly throughout the epic. The end of book two, spurred by Athena, Telemachus sets off for the Peloponnese, ostensibly to learn about the fate of his father, visiting the palaces of Kings Nestor and Menelaus. But part of this journey for Telemachus is one of discovery, about learning who Odysseus really is, this father who's been absent nearly his entire life. Indeed, in Book 1, Telemachus confides to Athena, disguised as Mentes, that he has doubts that Odysseus is even his real father. She notes a physical connection between the two, one we also see noted by Helen in Book 4. Athena says at line 206, but come now, tell me this and recount it truly, whether indeed, as big as you are, you're the son of Odysseus himself. You're terribly like him in your head and beautiful eyes. 
Telemachus's response is telling. Penelope and others say that he's Odysseus's son, but he has no proof. My mother says that I am his, and I, at any rate, do not know this, for no one ever knows his parentage for certain. Oh, would that, would that I were the son of some blessed man whom old age came upon in his possessions. But now the one who has the, mo who has the most unlucky of mortal men, by him they say, Fasi, that I was father, since you asked me about this. Indeed, for Telemachus, his father is all legend and no fact. His wish for a regular dad, one who stayed home, raised him, and died at the end of a normal life, almost prefigures Achilles' aspiration to have loved and died in the same way. With Telemachus's words in mind, we should take note of the context in which the tales told about Odysseus by his compatriots Nestor and Menelaus present and describe the hero. Of particular significance in this regard, I believe, is Menelaus's depiction of Odysseus as an athlete. Helen and Menelaus do offer stories of Odysseus before Menelaus presents him as a wrestler. Helen describes him sneaking into Troy on a nocturnal reconnaissance mission in disguise as a beggar. And Menelaus explains how Odysseus showed great restraint and control of the situation later when awaiting inside the horse itself. Both narratives clearly help prepare us for Odysseus's eventual return to Ithaca, with the knowledge that he engaged in prior experiences which have prepared him for the challenges he awaits in his own palace. But we'll see Telemachus doesn't appear to be affected by those stories in the same way in which he does the following one. For those in the audience, then and now, who know the Iliad, Odysseus's prowess in sport is a given. He wins the, funeral, uh, the foot race at the funeral games for Patroclus and draws with Ajax in wrestling, relying on, the te on technique and skill to take down his larger opponent. It should be noted that such a combination of skills in the real world seems unique. Pausinius only records one statue at Olympia of an athlete who ever won in both wrestling and running event at the same games, Eutelidus of Sparta, who won the boys wrestling and pentathlon games in 628 BC. Odysseus's skills as an all-around athlete were perhaps only equaled by Heracles, who supposedly won the stadium at Olympia and wrestled the Nemean lion into submission. In Book 4, lines 342 to 6, at the outset of his speech following the request of Telemachus for any news about his father, Menelaus first mentions Odysseus as follows. Being that sort of man, such as he was, once in well-founded Lesbos in a conflict, when he stood up and wrestled Philomelides and threw him down mightily, and all the Achaeans were delighted, if such an Odysseus would engage with the suitors, all would have a bitter marriage and die a quick death. When prompted by Telemachus to tell him what Menelaus knows about the whereabouts of the hero, this is how Menelaus introduces Odysseus, explicitly defining him in an athletic context. Menelaus' story associates athletic acumen with military prowess, but this connection is so direct and brief, and yet not explicit, that it hasn't received much comment. And it raises several questions. To quote Maureen Alden, we are not told why all the Greeks were on Lesbos, nor the occasion for Philomelides' challenge. We're not even told who Philomelides was, whether because the listener is expected to know, or because the information is not important." End quote. The language in the passage is both technical and generic, as is often the case in sport. The competition is framed in a single word, epilysin, the verb to wrestle, and the outcome is described in a single action, the throwdown, katabale. For the image and associated action, Homer relies on the knowledge his audience brings to the scene. And this is a crucial point I want to make about athletics in the Odyssey. Often depictions of athletics are similarly brief and generic. For those who know the games of the Iliad, one can import the lengthier descriptions from there and fill in the details. But if we focalize our reception of Menelaus' story through Telemachus, or are unfamiliar with the details of the Iliad ourselves, we must acknowledge that Telemachus has some definite knowledge of the event in question and its significance as a marker of Odysseus' status. I believe these lines and this image are so noteworthy because when Telemachus finally gets around to telling his mother of his journey, he selectively summarizes Menelaus' response, but quotes the king's presentation of Odysseus as wrestler word for word. The lines first seen in Book 4 reoccur in Book 17, lines 132 to 137. Now, one might be skeptical that I'm putting too much weight on this repetition and its significance, and so a closer look uh, is in order. Irene de Jong describes Telemachus' speech as shrewdly selective. About his trip to Sparta, he only briefly mentions seeing Helen. She merits only two lines of mostly negative opinion. 
But Telemachus chooses to repeat the outset of Menelaus' speech verbatim. Menelaus begins with a simile comparing Penelope, the suitors, and Odysseus to a doe whose fawns were killed while resting in a lion's den and follows with the image of Odysseus, the wrestler. Telemachus then omits Menelaus' long description of how he obtained information from Proteus and even the fact that the encounter happened in Egypt after Menelaus himself was delayed for several years. The information that Odysseus is held by Calypso is given only four lines, equal to the amount of time spent on relating the wrestling anecdote. If one thinks about it, this isn't illogical at all. Telemachus should just cut to the chase and say that Odysseus is still alive and he's being held by Calypso. Odysseus, adds, as a wrestler, adds nothing to the narrative, unless, of course, it does. Why do I think that Homer has Telemachus present the story in such a way? Again, if we put, our shoes, or put ourselves in Telemachus' shoes, this particular depiction of Odysseus must be equally as important as the fate of his father. Perhaps we can imagine it's because he's missed growing up with his father and the opportunity to, say, throw the discus around the backyard with his dad, or be taken to the local games some weekend like the other kids, or even compete at all. As we'll see shortly, the suitors regularly practice and compete in sport, as do the Phaeacians in Book 8. Athletic practice and knowledge form a part of elite life and education. Look at all the heroes in the Iliad who compete. Telemachus must have missed out on most of this, and to learn of the success and fame of his father in competition, however briefly mentioned, must evoke a certain pride and tell Telemachus and us, like Odysseus' own throw in Book 8, something significant about the status of this man. So much so that Telemachus has instant confidence when he actually meets with his father, transformed in looking like an athlete in Book 16. So Odysseus's wrestler is one of the first images of athletics that help, us, that help shape how we view Odysseus and other characters in the story. Though Telemachus doesn't repeat the rest of Menelaus's tale in Book 17, I want to return to Book 4 and the parts Telemachus omits in his conversation with Penelope. Much has been written about the, sto about the stories initially told by Helen and Menelaus, including by Professor Douglas Olson, who I think is here. As I mentioned, uh, the, hers includes an encounter with Odysseus in which uh, she somehow coaxes him to reveal all of the Greeks' plans. And Menelaus makes us wonder on whether or not Helen was trying to betray the Achaeans holed up in the horse. Though both stories present Odysseus as a key figure in ways that prefigure his actions on Ithaca, they also present Menelaus as, a potentially, inf as potentially inferior to uh, Odysseus. Why didn't he sneak into Troy himself? Why didn't he restrain the other Greeks in the horse? I suggest that Menelaus' narrative of his encounter with Proteus can be read as a response to the tales which he and Helen have told, and in the context of Odysseus' victory in wrestling, also present him as an athlete and thus as an individual of heroic status. For the knowledge needed for his own nostos, Menelaus must inf obtain information from the shape-shifting Proteus. The language and the scene we must imagine recall that of wrestling or pancreation such as the many depictions of Heracles we have grappling uh, the Nemean lion, such as those here. Or perhaps more relevant are those depicting Heracles grappling with Triton. Admittedly, Menelaus's will be a group effort, but in describing how he should take down Proteus, Menelaus follows the advice of Edothea, the changeling's own daughter, who initially presents the scene in the second person singular. Edothea says to Menelaus that, if you could somehow lie in wait and seize him, he would tell you uh, your way and the measure of your journey, and of your return, how you may go over the fish-filled sea. Lelabestai, from Lombano, seems like a generic verb, but it's also used as a technical wrestling and pancreation term in grabbing and seizing the body. It appears in Philostratus and in Oxyrhynchus Papyri, which detail the sports. The image of grappling with an opponent until they tire, give up, and submit is one often depicted in the outcomes of pancreation. And we've seen that in the slides I've shown you. A few lines later, Menelaus presses Adathea for more advice, using language appropriate for the sport as much as for the broader plan to surprise and capture Proteus. Now you yourself devise the means of entrapment of the divine old man, lest somehow he foresee or learn beforehand and elude me, for to subdue a god is difficult for a mortal man. Michael Polyakov, who has collected examples of the terminology used in combat sports, does not identify aleatai to avoid or elude as one of his terms, but I do think that its meaning encapsulates concepts inherent to the sport, 
as does the idea of line 395. For tri trickery, deception, and escape are part of the sport, as illustrated by Odysseus's own efforts to take down Ajax at Iliad lines 710 and 725, where his knowledge of the sport and trickery too are noted. Menelaus then presses for more details on how to capture Proteus, and Edithea provides step-by-step -step instructions. As soon as you see that he's laid down to rest, then right after you must be concerned with both his, both his might and power and hold him right there. Though he strives and is eager to escape, becoming all things he will test you, as many beasts as exist on earth, and water and wondrously blazing fire, then you must hold him firmly and squeeze harder. Describing an athlete as strong and powerful is not unique to sport but we do see such a description with the same diction associated with Odysseus, the suitors, the Phaeacians, monsters like the Cyclops, and Ajax in the Iliad wrestling scene. The hold, ekane, is a key move in combat sports. The repetition of the verb in lines 416 and 419 fosters the image of an athlete trying to get his competitor to submit, the way pancreation is won. Olisco in 416 doesn't seem to be a technical term, but the image is one that fits an athletic context. Periaomai is the verb par excellence that is used in the Iliad to introduce athletic contexts. And likewise, it appears repeatedly in Book 8 and elsewhere in the Odyssey associated with athletic competition. Piedzane, to hug, hold, or squeeze, is a technical term in wrestling and pain creation, and it seems representative of images I've shown previously. The Oxford Commentary does not note these particular word usages, but does comment generally, and I quote, we may compare the stories of Nereus and Achilleus wrestling with Hercules. I would emphasize that Homer's diction and imagery support a more definitive conclusion. Menelaus's story reaches its crescendo in his depiction of, an actu of the actual encounter, in which we see further examples of sporting imagery and language. Crying out, we rushed at him and we threw our arms around him, but the old man did not forget his cunning craft. But indeed, he first, became, first of all became a well-maned lion, then after that a serpent, a leopard, a wild boar, and then he became flowing water and a tree with high leafing branches. But we held him firmly with a courageous heart. But when at last the old man, well-versed in pernicious arts, grew weary, Proteus changes into even more things than Edithea had predicted. But let's focus on the image of Menelaus and his men. Keiras Baloman could be used to describe countless depictions of wrestling and pain creation, including the many I've shown. Balo may be a common verb, but it's used 11 times in the 30-line wrestling manual that survives as Pioxy 3, 466. Dolies Technes could be applied to a knowledge of a particular sport. You might also recall that Odysseus used a Dolon to take down Ajax in the Iliad wrestling scene, and the Sloha Hephaestus, a proxy for um, Odysseus in Demodocus' Song of Ares and Aphrodite, captures the duo through Tecne. A Stemphaeus Echomen recalls the well-known strategy of wearying an opponent. That verb, aniadsto, also appears in the wrestling scene between Ajax and Odysseus in the Iliad. What I think is equally significant is the number of lines given to the whole section of Menelaus' narrative. Admittedly, it does involve action, but the actual news about Odysseus's whereabouts are just a brief addendum of six lines to the accounts of the Nostoi of other heroes. And what I find striking is that here there are verbal echoes that occur multiple times elsewhere in athletic contests. Homer has Menelaus channel images of sport to define his heroic deeds. Indeed, Menelaus's tale, tale contains an important message for Telemachus and the audience. Menelaus was not the champion Achaean wrestler, Odysseus was. Yet Menelaus defeated a superhuman god, thus demonstrating his status as a leader and hero, and felt the need to describe in detail his feat using such vocabulary and imagery. Perhaps after his encounter with Proteus, it's no surprise he introduced Odysseus, as he does. To move to my second case study. In books 4 and 17, another set of lines is repeated, a brief five-line description of the suitors engaged in athletic practice. In Book 4, lines 625 to 9, we are told, But all the while the suitors in front of Odysseus's great hall enjoyed themselves, throwing discuses and javelins on a well-leveled flat surface, where they had often before full of hubris. Antinous, a god like Eurymachus, were seated, the leaders of the suitors, they were the best, preeminent in their excellence. Obviously, this is another example of athletics in the Odyssey. 
The lines are likely modeled on Iliad 2, 7, 74, where Achilles' men engaged in athletic practice and similar sports while waiting to fight. But the significance of these lines in the context of the Odyssey I don't think has been fully realized. They occur at two critical moments in the text. In Book 4, I argue they represent, for the first time, the suitors engaging in an activity which presents them as a physical threat. Prior to this point, the suitors did engage in verbal jousting and boasting, but they were solely depicted at leisure, feasting and consuming Odysseus's goods and abusing Penelope's hospitality. For example, in Book 1, lines 106 to 112, there she found the proud suitors. Then they were taking their pleasure at dice in front of doors, sitting on the hides of oxen which they themselves had slain. And for them, heralds and busy attendants, some were mixing wine and water in bowls, others were washing the tables with porous sponges and setting them out, while still others were apportioning much meat. And later in Book 1, lines 144 to 152, and in came the proud suitors. Then they sat down in rows on couches and chairs, and heralds poured water over their hands, and maids heaped, bad, heaped bread in baskets, and youths filled the bowls with drink. And they quickly set forth their hands on the refreshments lying ready before them. But after they had put away aside, their aside their desire for food and drink, the suitors' hearts took interest in other things, both song and dance. For these things are the highlight of a feast. Telemachus's evaluation of the suitors in Book 1, lines 159 to 65, emphasizes their, emphasizes their life of leisure and consumption. These men are concerned with things like these, the kithara and song, without care, since with impunity they devour the livelihood of another, of a man whose bo white bones, I suppose, rot in the rain as they lie on the mainland, or the waves roll over them at sea. If at any rate they were to see him return to Ithaca, they would all pray to be swifter in foot, rather than richer in gold and clothing. I could add other examples, but let's return to the description of the suitors in Book 4. So why does Homer wait until late in Book 4 to introduce the images of the suitor engaged in sport? As I said, I believe the activity sets up the idea that the suitors are indeed a serious threat to Telemachus's well-being, showing them in a slightly different light. The scene precedes the description of the suitor's plan at the end of Book 4 to ambush Telemachus as he returns to Ithaca. And I think that their depiction, engaged in athletics, keys the audience to that their role in the story is changing, or at the very least highlights a different aspect of their identity. For no longer are they simply occupiers of Odysseus's house and users of his resources, but a viable threat to the physical well-being of its inhabitants. Indeed, many scholars discuss the relationship between athletic competitions and practice as preparation for warfare generally, just not in this case. We see this connection in Odysseus's entry into the games of the Phaeacians and how seriously he takes the whole affair. This athletic scene in Book 4 also sets the stage for the ominous tension and cliffhanger, as Homer holds us in suspense, as much as we have in the Odyssey, uh, as to the fate of Telemachus upon his return to Ithaca, a fate we will only hear about 11 books later in Book 15. Now, were these lines isolated to book four? I think my interpretation would be valid. But they also occur, reoccur in book 17, and I believe offer further support for my theory. Here again, the lines introduce the idea of the suitors as an actual threat to the well-being of Telemachus, and now Odysseus as well. Though it may seem trite, I believe that the suitors' sporting activities serve as a reminder, again, to emphasize their status as trained figures ready for a fight. Madon, their favorite herald, follows these lines by inviting everyone into Odysseus's hall, setting up what would be the eventual final battle. Without these lines, one might question the viability of their threat to Telemachus and Odysseus, even though they're not as skilled fighters as Odysseus or even Telemachus or uh, Eumaeus. And so the eventual outcome is obviously not in doubt. But when seen engaged in sport, their general viability as adversaries is affirmed, and we in the audience are reminded of it. Whatever suspense or lack thereof we might have about the outcome is tempered by the fact that we now know or suppose that they'll put up some kind of fight, and this is not simply a slaughter of innocence. We already know their character is defective, something emphasized in these lines as well, but I think Homer adds these lines to present them as mature men who re represent some physical threat. Now, to the final section of my paper. A lot of things are thrown in the Odyssey. In a culture in which spears are a major weapon, we shouldn't be surprised to encounter many such accents and references in the text. 
Spears are the weapon of choice in the final melee in Odysseus's home. Odysseus himself was famously scarred as a youth while hunting with a spear. Even Zeus hurls spear-like thunderbolts as his destructive weapon of choice. But I want to look here at other objects that are thrown in the Odyssey, defining what follows in the category of discus or weight throws, rather than spear or javelin throws. There's several reasons for this, but suffice it to say that they all involve more substantial weight or mass than a spear, a spear, though it wouldn't challenge my overall thesis about athletics were we to imagine them as spear-type throws. Homer uses similar imagery and often language to demonstrate Odysseus's success as a thrower and others' lack thereof. And again, if we see athletic success broadly defined, functioning as a marker of identity and status, then these scenes provide us with further information about all the characters involved even those who dwell beyond the realm of the Greek world. For despite being defined in many ways as the other, they remain proximate and relatable, and I would argue imaginable, in that they still engage in many activities Greeks do, offering just, often just differing in scale, both physically, and in these cases, at the object's throne. Surely, one of the most iconic moments in the Odyssey occurs in Book 8. There, Odysseus, his ego bruised by the words of the young Phaeacian Euryalus, who critiqued his refusal to take part in the games, picks up a weight and far out hurls the other Phaeacian competitors. Odysseus's throw and his subsequent claims about his athletic prowess are direct indicators that he is not some pirate or traitor, as he is accused of being, but a truly heroic person. I'll briefly begin with a discussion of that famous scene and then follow with a discussion of several others which have received less attention and not collectively. The throws of Polyphemus in Book 9, the Lystragonians in 10, Antinous in 17, Eurymachus in 18, and Tisippus in 20. Now, I could spend hours talking about athletic competitions held by the Phaeacians in Book 8, but here's a quick summary of events and their place in the story on the off chance that you're not familiar with them. After building a raft and leaving Calypso's isle, Odysseus gets caught in a storm and shipwrecked at the instigation of Poseidon, though as he tells it, he was struck by a bolt thrown by Zeus. Odysseus washes ashore, ashore meets the local princess Nausicaa, and makes it to the palace of her parents Alcinous and Arete, where he's hospitably received. But when Alcinous notices him crying during an ensuing feast, specifically at the bard Demodocus' song about a quarrel between Achilles and Odysseus himself, the king suggests that the Phaeacians try their hand at some athletic contests, a athlon perethomen. The sports the Phaeacians compete in, boxing, wrestling, the long jump, and foot race, are all very briefly described, most in one line. Again, understanding is reliant on audience knowledge of sports or stories, such as the Iliad, in which they're treated in more detail. The contests are not competitions for prizes, so unlike the Iliad, in which they are um, but they are held to entertain and to impress. The participants are repeatedly defined as elite young men in Phaeacian society, so their status parallels that of the suitors I discussed previously. Odysseus initially abstains from competition, declining a polite invitation by Alcinous's son Laodamus. He only participates when Euryalus taunts him. Homer uses the verbal form of nakos, the word used to describe the quarrel recently mentioned in Demodocus's song, uh, to describe the action that leads it off. But the really offensive claim, it seems, is that Odysseus doesn't appear to be a man who knows athletics, an idea which is repeated twice in a speech ending with the apparently damning phrase, you don't seem to be an athlete. Athlete, um, theory, uh, sorry, ude athlete, eoikos. Uh, Odysseus's response is articulate and measured, but it's clear that he feels he cannot let the statement and assessment pass. As he ends his speech, he even applies language associated with athletics to describe his present circumstances. For example, when he says he is being held in the grip of pain and suffering, he uses echo my. The Oxford Commentary even notes the metaphorical use recalls wrestling. Odysseus then picks up and hurls a stone discus, farther than any of the Phaeacians had. Then, having spun around, he sent it from his stout hand and the stone hummed as it flew. As an aside, and I hope you do indulge me for a moment here, how many of you have ever thrown a discus? You can raise your hand for those who are here. 
Not, not too many, but those who have, I think, will acknowledge that it is, it is not easy. And it is not something that's purely reliant on strength, but it really does rely on a knowledge and technique. I, in my annual courses or biannual courses I teach on Greek sport, I teach a lot of Division I athletes, and I will say, over my years, even as I've gotten older, I do pretty well in that competition. Um, and it's not because I'm bigger or stronger than most of the individuals, it's because I have practiced and done this a few times in my life. And so I, I think we really need to, you know, um, appreciate uh, Odysseus's efforts here. And, and if you have, I think, uh, you know, you, you do. And if you haven't, I would invite you to do it someday. Anyhow, after Athena uh, marks the throw, Odysseus follows with a second speech, one of his grades, right? Full of bravado, boasting that he can defeat any comers in all sports, whether Phaeacians or anyone in the world, of course, except in a sprint. The speech explicitly links athletic success and his own status and shows the hyper-competitive nature of Odysseus. I'll move on, but another takeaway to stress is that this is such a significant moment in the Odyssey because we see Odysseus compete with other people for the first time. We have heard about him in books one through four, but seen him mostly suffer at sea or weep in previous books. And this is also one of the rare stories with a positive outcome in which Odysseus acts entirely on his own initiative. That is noteworthy. Athena doesn't intervene. He acts with his own skills and knowledge, and it's through athletic competition that we see the hero who we've heard so much about come to light. Other throwers in the Odyssey are less successful, but their actions help further define our image of Odysseus and the throwers themselves. In Book 9, having escaped the Cyclops' cave, Odysseus cannot hold back his taunts to Polyphemus once aboard his ship. Of course, this is what will cause him years of pain, and it's clear that his aforementioned hyper-competitive nature is a double-edged sword. In the first description of Polyphemus' throws, Homer uses Balo and Hiemi. So I spoke, and then he became even more angry at heart. And having broken off the peak of a great mountain, he hurled it at us, and in front of the, um, it fell in front of the dark proud ship, close by and just missed coming in contact with the tip of the rudder. Polyphemus, as one might expect from a giant monster, throws something epically large. But I want to pause to underscore not only the verbs used to throw, but other similarities to Odysseus in Book 8. There, he threw only when angered by Euryalus. Here, Homer uses the same verb, kolo'o, to introduce Polyphemus' throw. Athena described Odysseus' throw in Book 8 with Hiemi. In Book 9, Homer uses directional adverbs to give the audience the sense of how close the boulders are to the ship, yet each misses the mark. Polyphemus' throw is, go is described as going um, past the ship, pro para oide, ortha, yet it nearly grazes the rudder, which is at the ship's stern. Though I should note that Aristarchus, amongst others, rejects line 483 seemingly because it shares elements from Polyphemus' next throw, and commentators have struggled with the internal logic of the scene here. Yet, for the sake of this evening at least, I'm not so hasty to reject it. How could we imagine it then? Well, I would argue it might be similar to what we see in Book 8, where Dis Odysseus's discus whizzes over the heads of the Phaeacians. Here, Polyphemus's throw passes over the entire ship, narrowly averting the rudder, rigging in crew, but then sailing over and landing in its front. Odysseus's crew, as become the norm, are unsuccessful at changing his course of action. He continues to taunt Polyphemus. Again, note the verbs to throw in the following passage. Stubborn man, why do you want to provoke the savage in anger who just now hurled the missile into the sea and drove our ship back again to land? And indeed, we thought we'd be destroyed there. And if he had heard one of us uttering a sound or speaking, he would have smashed our heads in the timbers of the ship. Having hurled a jagged rock, so strongly does he throw. Polyphemus' second throw falls a bit short of the ship. But he lifted up, Again, an even bigger stone, he whirled about and hurled it, putting enormous strength into his throw. He threw it a little behind the dark proud ship, here's that line close by, and just missed coming in contact with the tip of the rudder. Loss isn't the same word as lithos, initially the word used in book eight, but it is the word that Homer uses for Odysseus's discus as it sails over the heads of the Phaeacians. Likewise, Homer describes the stone um, as bigger, using meesona, as he did of Odysseus's discus initially in Book 8. And though we imagine the ship is sailing away, so it naturally would get harder to hit, Polyphemus's throw now comes up short. Note the directional adverb places his throw behind the stern. So unlike Odysseus's throw, which far outdistances the other competitors and what they could ever do, 
Polyphemus seems mortal. Most importantly, Epidineo introduces the same image of whirling or spinning that we saw with Odysseus's throw. It is this verb in particular that makes me think of Polyphemus's throws as discus-like and to set them beside Odysseus's in our minds. And this may alone be the point. How are we to imagine Polyphemus here? Yes, as a non-Greek other and a monster, yet one who throws boulders is one would throw a discus. And so we have little trouble imagining the scene play out in our own minds. And remember, Odysseus is telling this story to the Phaeacians, who are likely all on hand to witness his own throw that had just occurred. In the next book, Odysseus describes his crew's encounter with the giant Lystragonians. Whereas Polyphemus hurled a mountain peak at Odysseus' ship in Book 9, line 141, and in Book 10 at line 113, the wife of King Antiphates is described as just being as big as one, with exactly the same phrase. So textual connections exist between the two episodes. After gobbling up a crewmate, again like Polyphemus, the Lystragonians hurl boulders at Odysseus' ships. They're more successful in that they impale members of the fleet. The verb used is balo, and here we have a different word for the objects thrown. From the cliffs, with boulders as huge as a man could lift, they pelted us, and at once the dread, a dreadful din rose through the uh, ships. And at the same time, both from men perishing and from the ships that were being smashed. Again, my point here is simply to illustrate how we might imagine these throws drawing on athletic images and knowledge and vocabulary, and how they serve to connect the actions of Odysseus and his adversaries. Upon his return to Ithaca, Odysseus is the target of three throws, all errant. And again, I imagine them visually like Odysseus's throw in Book 8, serving to tell us something about the status and abilities of the hurlers. For though Antinous and Eurymachus were described as the best of the suitors, as we saw earlier, here their skills, or lack thereof, hint at the demise they will soon face when faced with engaged with Odysseus, with real weapons and their lives on the line. In Book 17, Antinous throws a stool. In Book 18, Eurymachus also throws a stool. In Book 20, Tisippus throws an ox hoof. We should also note that Odysseus is more and more successful at avoiding the objects as the narrative proceeds. Or one could argue the inverse, that the suitors become worse and worse throwers. Antinous's throw actually hits Odysseus in the shoulder, Eurymachus hits the cupbearer, and the third misses entirely. Now, if I had time, I'd show that Homer uses verbal echoes and similar imagery to the passages I've discussed. But alas, you'll have to, as they say, you'll have to wait till it comes out in print. Um, but there are definite connections between all of those scenes and the ones that preceded them. And indeed, there are many more scenes and images of athletics in the epic. For example, boxing, jumping, running, chair racing, and archery. Unfortunately, terminology describing sports can be rather bland. Imagine what we use in English today. Whether an interested party or if you're a disinterested observer who's forced by some significant other or a social gathering to listen or watch a modern sports broadcast, you'll often be struck by the banality of the commentary, such as the need to say, throw the ball or run the ball in football. So it should not be shocking when we encounter the same in ancient sports. For example, in ancient wrestling and pancreation, we, should frequently, we do frequently see and we should expect to see technical terms like grab or throw using common verbs such as echo, hold, lambano, grab or take, and ballo to throw. But if one has sports on the mind, as we know the ancients did, then whenever we encounter these verbs, we should be aware that they might allude to athletics and have a particular, particular associative meaning. This isn't all to say that we should this isn't all to say we probably shouldn't expect too much technical language, but I do believe that Homer includes some throughout the poem, as well as images he creates that refer to or allude to athletic competition. Hopefully, the scenes I've shown and selected today have shown this to some degree. Thank you. to take questions from those here or those online, I suppose. Yes, I, I want to open the floor for questions uh, to both our audience here and also uh, our online audience. Professor Olson. So, um, I really like the idea of polyphemus as an athlete. I really like the idea of polyphemus as an athlete. Um, 
But there's something that troubles me about that, which is that, um, as you brought out, you know, athletics is really used as a class marker, mm -hmm. um, and in other words, a mark of good people, if yeah. you will, throughout the Odyssey. It would be a very odd move to take Polyphemus, who's really, you know, Odysseus talks him down in mm -hmm. every way, um, and and do this thing where you turn him into uh, an athlete. It seems like kind of the wrong, the wrong thing to do with the monster who, you know, in other words, is the is the other in all sorts of ways. Can you just kind of talk yeah. about that? No, I think that's that's a, that's a great that? point, and I, I think it's, it's it's something I need to think a little bit further about. But I think one of the things that when Odysseus is telling his story is, is that. I think yeah, he's setting himself against all of these monsters to make them impressive, right? And so they have certain qualities that do make them very distinct from, from Greek civilization, right? But there are certain things where there are these similarities, um, whether strength or size or something like that. So it might be more about how we, as I said, sort of imagine the throws to be, and th those sort of sharing and that sort of similar vision um, and idea. So, so not sort of an athlete in the in the sort of moral sense, to your point, but I do think in the sort of visual context of how we might imagine the scene playing out, and that's really what I think is is the most important of that scene. So, but I agree with you. It's a it's a good point that when we're talking about strictly sort of Greek athletics, they're used as with the suitors, as with uh, you know. The Phaeacians themselves and Odysseus, they're used to talk about sort of a moral to a certain degree. I don't know what would, there might be a better term, but something about their status and identity within their community. I think you're exactly right there. And 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 that almost comes up with the suitors with the qualification of that line about that they, they did this with hubris, right? And so there was almost an additional qualifier um, after the sports. I, I think it's a good point. I'll have to think about it a bit more, but, but thank you for that. Thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering about the first episode with the uh, contest with Proteus. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by uh, Proteus, just as they're rushing upon him, is called the old man, yeah. Hogaron, uh, which makes it sound at least at first like it's an unequal contest. And you know, you've got all of these young the, the young guy rushing up to confront the old guy, it seems unfair somehow to me. And I'm just wondering, you know, how you would interpret that in, in the context of what you've been discussing. Yeah, it's, I think I, it's, it's sort of similar to Professor Olson's point there. Of the, uh, sort of these, I think this is true a lot with the Odyssey, that there are things that run sort of in opposition to each other. But I, I, I do think that, uh, that the line I quoted, and I go back to the slide too, but just that, that Menelaus is, is emphasizes, right, when he asks Edithea the sort of second time, he says it's really hard for a man to defeat a god, right? So I think the idea is that he's old, yes, but also is a divine figure, and that sort of trumps his status as, as an old person. But you're quite right that that actually does sort of counter the narrative of, let's say, Odysseus beating sort of more youthful people. And maybe that's the contrast, right? Odysseus has to defeat all of these younger competitors repeatedly, whereas for Menelaus, that's not the case. So that's a great point. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, ex I mean, with Menelaus, I think it's deliberate there that mm -hmm. he's, you know, he's attacking an old man, although he's trying to make his, this sound like this great epic contest that he's won. Yeah. In fact, he has, he's attacking an old guy. So. Uh, yeah, I, no, you can, I, you I can pursue it further, right? Cutting. You could say that not only, you know, the old man is basically asleep. <laughs> um, and that initially, I mean, I do love how the story starts out in the second person singular and then moves to the second person plural. And then all of a sudden when we see it happen, it is sort of a group contest, right? Which, you know, someone had commented to me before when I threw these ideas at them that, that this sort of runs counter to Greek sport, right? It's always individuals competing against each other. Never do we have this sort of team activity in any shape or form. So yeah, there's definitely something wrong with, in a sense, Menelaus is, if we do want to view it as an athletic competition, um, that, that it, it's, it's very different than what, what Odysseus engages in. But I do think he still frames it in those terms, because to, to my point, again, trying to sort of talk a lot about his own self after the stories that we've seen uh, lead up to that point. So thank you for that. We have a question in the balcony, but I think if uh, the, the thing is, if you call it out, I'll repeat it. So, so because the, the online people won't hear. You mentioned that throwing the discus does not necessarily mean strength, but it has to do more with learning and style. 
And you made the reference when you teach your athletes. Yeah. I mean, and I would, it's not necessarily archaeology, it has to do more with athletics, but I would be very interested to hear a little bit how you are teaching your athletes and you're making references uh, to. Sure. To the question was just about how I incorporate sort of actual real life using of the discus with the, the teaching and reading of the story. I, I, in my Greek sports class, we read the entire Odyssey. Um, and, and just one of the days we, we compete in various different events, one of which is, I mean, it's a friendly competition amongst uh, the classmates, but we, we go outside and we, we get a discus. I have to sign a few waivers. And it was one of the things that, uh, you know, I, it's just, it's, it's so interesting to see because I think you, people don't have any idea about how challenging it is. And we don't, you know, we, we say we're going to do it, but no one practices ahead of time or anything like that. And then uh, people, people try it just to see that the same thing because Odysseus does it cold in the story, right? The whole point is after he's angered and, and, and he has this emotional response, he literally just grabs this bigger discus than anyone else and instantly knows what to do after, in all likelihood, you know, many, many years of not lifting any kind of discus or practicing, he still has that technique down. So I think that size and strength obviously do matter to a certain degree, but, but definitely one needs to know the sport. And that, I think, to me, says a lot more about him. So especially as I, you know, I'm getting closer to the age that Odysseus is, when I'm, it's harder to compete with students who are in their 20s. So I appreciate him all the more. But thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Is this on? Yes. yes. Thank you so much, Sanjay, for this really interesting talk. I, I really just have a comment rather mm -hmm. than a question, and it's to come back to um, Doug Olson's mm -hmm. question to you. Um, I, I, it's true that Polyphemus is shown as an athlete, but I think what's really important is what he's throwing. Mm -hmm. um, that he's not throwing man-made objects, but, but the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's true that Odysseus eventually picks up a stone and he, he throws that, but he throws it in anger. Mm -hmm. And we know in vase painting, for example, when we see stone throwing, it tends to be at least mythological figures. These are really primitive figures. Mm -hmm. This, is, this mm -hmm. is something that um, uh, sophisticated people wouldn't do, uh, and it needs no skill yeah. to do it. So I think that's worth thinking about. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a, that's a great point. Thank you for that. Oh, wonderful. We, we have a lot of questions oh. online. You're, so you're not off the hook yet. Okay. Uh, uh, you can but, pick the best up. <laughs> but uh, let me just uh, share uh, some. Uh, the first question is from Cynthia Patterson. And she asks, can you say anything about female athletics? I think, it, it, again, with respect to the Odyssey. Yeah, this is actually something I thought a little bit about, and some people have written on this. I think it's in Fred Allen uh, Reisman's book um, that they talk about, especially the scene in book eight, that it shifts to almost exclusively a sort of male sphere. Um, and I might be wrong as to who wrote this, so someone um, can correct me later. But uh, that uh, Athena transforms into a sort of male figure when she is marking the throw of Odysseus, that it's, it sort of seems like a very sort of male. Um, uh, viewership at that particular moment, and obviously the competition and discourses between uh, the men that's there. Um, I wonder about when, when, um, when the story is told to Penelope, the way that Telemachus tells the story. Um, it's just interesting to me that he highlights, obviously, the athletics part, which is obviously important to him. I'm not so sure that that um, is what Penelope would find most interesting of all the information that he has. Um, so I do wonder if there is you know, that these activities obviously are presented in sort of sphere of male competition and intramale competition, and whether that is sort of an exclusive or maybe more exclusive, I don't want to be um, so committal at this point, um, discourse amongst the, the constituency, so that that would be sort of, yeah, a sort of intramale vocabulary about identity and status more than something broadly. I mean, I don't want to push that too hard at this point, but it's definitely something I've thought about, so. Thank you. And uh, Nancy Felsen yeah. says, uh, I wonder if some of the throws by Polyphemus uh, and later by the suitors have a humus, humorous parodying flavor. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd probably like to talk for a little bit more detail about where we might find those comedic elements. Um, 
I could definitely see it. I don't think I've seen it in the text myself. And so I, I think I just need to look at that a little bit more closely. But obviously, yeah, there are people who do read you know, the Polyphemus episode in itself as sort of comedic, right? Um, and, so, and so, and obviously interpreters later right, in the tradition have picked up Polyphemus and becomes a kind of comic character. So I think that, yeah, looking for that might be another avenue. I haven't um, yet, but, but thank, thank you, <coughs> Professor Belson. Yeah. It, they keep coming. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Theo Marinos asks, has two general questions okay. uh, for all of us in the context of Homer and sport. One, uh, was Homer himself a good athlete? Uh, so did he know exactly what he was writing about? And two, assuming he was a good sportsman, did he nevertheless perhaps misrepresent things for dramaturgical reasons? Uh, conclusion, as a sports expert, can anyone prove that Homer made mistakes? Um, <laughs> the last one's a hard one to answer as sort of a definitive question. I think, I mean, this, this opens up the, the, what I tried to skillfully or maybe not so skillfully avoid is a whole range of Homeric questions about yeah, who we're defining here as Homer and, and what we're trying to say about sports. And then also when we're thinking about sort of reception of, of the Odyssey, are we thinking about a person who's hearing it shortly after it's composed or in its auditory phase? Are we thinking about someone who's reading the text in the, or listening to the text in the fifth century BC or something like that, where you do have vases that are in this context that pr pr produce ideas. Um, you know, some of the descriptions in the Odyssey, the question is the short ones in book eight about the sprint, it happens, or a boxing match, it's described, you know, single adjectives or adverbs describe the sport and that's it. So, you know, it's hard or it's difficult, something like that. Um, anybody could use that that descriptor and not know something about the sport, but whereas the Iliad's got lengthier descriptions on things. So, uh, you know, I'm not a chariot racer myself, so I don't, I, I can't say anything about the authenticity of those particular sports. I have wrestled in my past as well as informally thrown the discus. I mean, I think all of these things seem to be true, but as I hopefully pointed out, the vocabulary can be so generic and rather simple that you don't necessarily need to have anything, I think, more than just a general framework of what these sports entail. But um, I do think that they occur with such frequency and, 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 and are, are sort of uh, repeated elements that there's definitely some knowledge and acknowledgement of this being a, a sort of part of the society and an important one of that. And of course, we see that evolve in Greek culture, so I don't think that that's a shocking um, suggestion. But I think that's quite how I'd answer that question. Uh, Rush Ram uh, uh, asks, and he says, uh, as a recent question pointed out, Barbette, um, athlete, athletes uh, are usually young. Mm -hmm. Is Odysseus' success as an athlete a way to mark him as a virtually young man, preparing for his reconnection with his wife, also a potential new bride? I'm wondering about athletic success and erotic sexual potential in Homer. I'll answer the first part. I'm not so sure about the second, because I think he's still at least 40-something when he, when he gets home. Um, and, and like the Odyssey, it just leaves us in the bedroom and that's it. Um, but I will say for the former part, I mean, I think part of it is that in many senses, Odysseus has to go back to that moment 20 years ago or, or however long to that point where he is, he is back in his prime to take out um, the, you know, kill the over 100 suitors that are in his house who are in their 20s and all probably, you know, they're, they're young. Um, and so they are in the prime of life. And I think as we watch sports, uh, those of you who watch sort of modern sports, you know, mid 40s is, is the end. Tom Brady just retired, right? Famous athlete, mid 40s. You think about the professional athletes, that's usually, that's usually it at the highest level. And that's with modern technology and knee replacements and surgeries and so on and so forth. So trying to imagine this as, as a realistic thing, I think, yeah, for Odysseus, um, it does show you how an incredible individual he is. Um, and the fact that he's able to do all these things repeatedly at that age is something that is remarkable and sets him apart. So, and I, I think that would be true, you know, I mean, we don't have all the ages for Olympic athletes in there. <laughs> they don't put them, unfortunately, on their, uh, uh, on, on the inscriptions. But, uh, I mean, if we do, I imagine they're, they're in a much younger age. So um, that is something that separates Odysseus in particular, that he's still able to do this. And it obviously, yeah, is important because he's gonna have to compete against them when he returns home. Right. Okay. Um, can you manage three more? Uh, uh, you're in charge. As many as a great online audience, and, uh, <laughs> and, and we might also have a few more in the 
in our uh, audience present. Okay, Jeff uh, Barno uh, uh, says, blinded Polyphemus could gauge direction better than distance from Odysseus's taunts. Uh, Polyphemus is a dumb or gullible opponent susceptible to the Udismetus trick. Another point, uh, in the Iliad, context, archer, uh, context archers were less noble or heroic and man-to-man uh, -man, man -man combat. Uh, in this, uh, uh, is this pertinent to Odysseus, who relies more on more than others on intelligence? Or it was it was the man-to-man -man fighters. Sorry, he corrected. Yeah, I don't know about more. Um, I don't know about more important, but I think one of the things that sets Odysseus apart is that, I mean, this is like his competition in the Iliad, how he's able to take Ajax down. Um, who's bigger and stronger than him explicitly described as such in the wrestling scene, right? Is that, you know, he may, he may be bigger and stronger, but Odysseus is both willing to engage in trickery, which is fine in the Greek world, and he's also, you know, knows the sport uh, well and knows his own body really well. So I think this is what sets Odysseus apart and is part of his characteristic, is he's not only a successful soldier and fighter, but also has this knowledge that makes him a particular figure. Um, and, and the stories that are told about him highlight that, whether that's um, in the Iliad or in the Odyssey or in, in other sources. So that's, yeah, I think that's how I would answer that question. And uh, Richard Fisher shares, uh, Sanjay, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Odysseus in the Odyssey seems to be an all around superlative in many aspects, fighter, athlete, uh, sexual prowess, cunning mind, schemer, planner, trickster, speaker. As a leader of men, he is not so illustrious. Do you see Odysseus's manifestations of arete as contributing to an overall idealization of the heroic, aristocratic, advantage, adventurer fighter figure uh, that characterizes his individual, individuality and self-image, but is in conflict with more collective or social parameters making the hero again problematic? Okay, that's a, that's a long question, I appreciate it. Um, I think what I would answer is to, you know, uh, to, to the crewmates of Odysseus and things like that, 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 it, that I would say yes, that it is about the individual and, and his heroic status, and that the, the crewmen are often described as not doing such, you know, uh, upstanding things, not listening to his command, and so on and so forth. If they'd only done X or Y or Z, they would have, or more of them perhaps, potentially would have survived. But I do think it is about um, the individual of such status leading and not about sort of the communal, I don't know, what we might see in, in later periods of Greek history as, a, as in what makes a leader or something like that. So, yeah, I would agree with that. Thank you. Um, now, now our online uh, uh, commenters are, are commenting on our com uh, on oh, okay. other online. <laughs> Nancy Felsen actually comments on Rush's question and says, oh, "This is actually wonderful." Um, uh, the use of Hebesius uh, by Odysseus in Book Eight and in Twenty Three links athleticism to age. Yeah. In Eight, Odysseus worries about being weakened. In Twenty Three, he doesn't think anyone, even a god or a, a youth. Abesius could have moved the bed he made. I think that's yeah. But then um, uh, uh, on uh, Peter Allen comments, what about the intervention of the gods and goddesses on Odysseus's behalf, negating his age difference? This is, this is actually an interesting one because um, some people do comment that at the beginning of eight, Athena does make him um, bigger and uh, I can't remember the adjectives off the top of my head, but there's two, two descriptors. But, and so that obviously factors into both how he is received by the Phaeacians who then comment on that. Um, but the question is, you know, as I said, when you sort of throw a discus, it's not just about how big, being bigger and stronger. So and to me, that may help him throw the biggest discus or the one that's bigger than the others. But I do think there's something inherent about his knowledge of sport and, and his own, you know, what he brings himself to the situation um, that, that definitely does set him apart. Um, but it is, it is a question of, this has come up obviously with Odysseus a lot, right? The degree to which he's assisted in things. But I would say that the, the, the example in book eight is as, probably as close as we can get in sort of positive stories of him, him acting relatively independently. I'll just put it as relatively. Um, whereas I think, you know, when we get to, to the slaughter of the suitors and things, like the whole plan is him and Athena 
and and so this is something that yeah he does on his own. Certainly, him deciding to partake in the games is is entirely his own. Um, you know, is because he's he's taunted by the others. So um, I think that that's yeah something that's independently motivated. So. Um, uh, we have an anonymous attendee who okay. asks, um, or, or the Iliad and Odyssey describe pre-Dorian societies, athletics uh, that are interlinked to funeral games and military training, quite similar to Alexander the Great's era. Limited links to the 7th century BC onwards uh, Panhellenic Olympic Games, which dignified peace games. Uh, any comment on this small paradox? On the paradox, I, and I'm unclear as to what the paradox is. I don't want to ask a follow-up because it might take, we might lose them in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I just more broadly say is that, you know, I mean, sports and, and the way they're viewed and who competes in them evolves over time. And so, yeah, in some sense, they are in the Iliad and the Odyssey respective of their moment. And in the Iliad and the Odyssey, they differ between the two of them, right? In the Iliad, they're funeral games, and in the Odyssey, we just have funeral games briefly mentioned with Achilles. We don't actually, you know, we don't see them transpire. The games of the Phinations seem to be entertainment, and as I argued with the games that take place by the suitors, they're entertainment amongst themselves, but not in the same way. It's kind of competitive, right? So, um, sure, there's some pleasure they gain from it, but there's also probably the development of certain skills that will then engage, then um, come out in sort of warfare and, and other activities. So, um, you know, that's, I'd say, a difference between the two texts in, in terms of how they handle and illustrate things. And then, yeah, obviously, as you go to different contexts, things do change. Okay. Yeah. And, and perhaps we could actually uh, close out our questions, Re really where we, we began again with, with Cindy Patterson, okay. um, who says that she was thinking more specifically about Nausicaa and her friends playing ball. Oh, okay. Uh, and in general and in the larger sense in women's competition. Oh, I mean, it's a good question. The, the question is, is the sort of ball game sort of more of just an entertainment, a kind of leisure activity? It's, it's, I, I don't think it's described in the same sort of competitive terms as we see the things that are happening um, in, later on in, in, in book eight. Um, and so I just sort of think of it in, as, as much more of sort of the entertainment um, aspect of things. Um, but it's a, good, it's a good one to bring up, so I'll have to, I'll have to take a closer look at it and think about it. But thank you for, for raising that, because it's definitely on a list of, of things that are often talked about as sport, um, because it's, you know, it is described as, but I think it's a game that it's described as, typically. So I'll look at that more closely, but thank you. Do we have any other questions here in the audience? Uh, oh, wait, just one, and then uh, this will be our last. I want to follow up on the stone thing, mm -hmm. um, because it does strike me that it's very low class. Mm -hmm. um, Odysseus does not throw a stone in book eight, right? He picks yeah. up a discus. But the other people that throw stones that I can think of are, you know, Eumaeus scatters the dogs mm -hmm. by yeah. throwing stones. Yeah. And then Telemachus threatens Eumaeus that he will throw stones at him, right, if yeah. Eumaeus gives him trouble. So it really, right, remember when he's mm -hmm. worried that he won't follow orders? And this really strikes me as a, a, a herdsman type of thing, um, which is absolutely appropriate for, for, for Polyphemus, right? Yeah. But really not a thing that, a, you know, an upper class sort of person, you wouldn't throw a stone, mm -hmm. you know? That's trash, you'd throw a yeah. discus. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, on that note, uh, I'd like to uh, have us all thank uh, Sanjay and uh, Ritter, uh, Ritter, Pair downstairs for a glass of wine together. Thank you.